When Anthony Christopher hired a community outreach coordinator for his children's therapy center, he had no idea that her 90 days of employment would lead to years of harassment, his arrest, and a $3.57 million defamation lawsuit. And then he learned he wasn't the only one making accusations against the same woman, LaDonna Humphrey. I'm Charlie and welcome to Crime Lines. Hello and welcome to Crime Lines. If this is your first episode, do not expect this every week. This is a huge departure from my usual format where I just sit down and tell everyone a true crime story that I have absolutely no connection to. But this case, even though it's not the type of case I usually cover and it's not the format I usually use, is important and something I've wanted to cover because it impacts not just the true crime content creator space, which I am in, but also the advocacy and victims' families side of things that I want to support. The way this episode will go is that I'm going to tell you about my connection to the situation, which is superficial by any measure, and then we're going to hear an interview I did with Anthony Christopher, who is so deeply connected to this that he has been harassed, arrested, cleared, and won a defamation lawsuit over it. What I'm talking about is the subject of the most recent season of the Pretend podcast, Who's Afraid of LaDonna Humphrey? And you are going to hear an extended clip from that first episode so that you can sort of try it before you buy it, even though the podcast is free and you can just go listen to all 16 episodes right now. Follow Pretend in your favorite podcast app, because I know once you hear part of the story, you're going to want to hear the rest. So to start with my connection to this and why I care enough to dedicate an entire Crime Lines episode to it, I have been such a longtime listener of Pretend that I still call it Pretend Radio. Does anyone else do that? I didn't even notice that he dropped the radio part until very recently. At the first True Crime Podcast Festival in 2019, I invited the host, Javier, to a panel that I was moderating, and the panel was just about podcasting in general. So that's to say I've been a longtime listener of Javier's, but I've also known him for a number of years. Pretend is a podcast about real people pretending to be someone else. Javier has covered topics like undercover informants, plenty of scam artists of all types, an alleged cult leader, and even a woman who pretends to be pregnant only to then hire doulas and traumatize them with her made-up stories of sexual abuse and birth trauma. It's, it's a lot. You can't even make up half the stories Javier covers because no one would believe you. But when Javier released the promo picture for his most recent season called Who's Afraid of LaDonna Humphrey, my jaw was on the floor. I think I DM'd him within two seconds of seeing it. I have met LaDonna one time at CrimeCon UK, and we made some vague plans to get together since we only live a few hours apart, but it was very much the let's go have coffee sometime level of planning that neither of us followed through on. So I'm not claiming that I know LaDonna at all, just that I've met her once. We do have quite a bit in common on paper, at least, which is why we started talking the first time we met. We both have several children that span a wide range of ages. And honestly, parenting teens and young adults, while you're still getting woken up in the middle of the night to change toddler bedsheets, That's just not something everyone can relate to. So when we find someone else in that same scenario, we tend to connect. And of course, we work in the same genre, true crime. I pretty much only podcast and make TikToks occasionally, but LaDonna does podcasting. She writes books. She's made a documentary. She runs a true crime fest. And she's also worked in the nonprofit realm of true crime, like she worked with the Morgan Nick Foundation a number of years ago. And right now she has her own nonprofit, All the Lost Girls, that seems to be solely focused on the murder of Melissa Witt. There is audio Javier played on the Pretend podcast of LaDonna saying that she always wanted a career in true crime and she would do anything hard work wise to get there. And her track record does prove that. She has definitely been working to have a career in the true crime genre for probably 20 years. And I definitely don't judge her for that because I also have a career in this genre. I sort of fell into it. I have always had an interest in the legal system and human behavior, 
So, of course, true crime was a natural fit for me when I would read up on cases and watch documentaries and get interested in it. I had been podcasting for several months before I had the chance to take my interest in true crime and then my podcasting hobby and combine them. And while I'm not saying I didn't work to get where I am or work to stay here, I definitely didn't spend 20 years doing it. And a lot of my success as far as making true crime podcasting my full-time job is about timing. I started early before the industry was saturated. With how long LaDonna has been in true crime, I would have thought I would have crossed her path earlier, but I did not. But really, my first introduction to who she was before I met her was because she had a falling out with another podcaster. And I don't really know that podcaster either, but a close friend of mine ended up in the middle when LaDonna started sending her screenshots of a conversation that they were having about my friend where they were talking badly. So what I basically knew about LaDonna was that she gossiped a little bit, but like me too. That's something else we have in common, I guess. I mind everybody's business, which you probably guessed if you know I like to watch vapid reality TV. What I don't do, though, is I don't backbite my friends, and I don't like when other people do it because I'm also a loyal friend. So thankfully, LaDonna and my friends seem to have smoothed things over, and it was just a side drama. So when we met in CrimeCon UK, everything was fine. As you will hear in my conversation with Anthony, I did know a bit about her lawsuit with him, but that didn't really overlap into my world because that is someone running a therapy practice for children, not true crime. And so I didn't think Javier was going to do an entire season on LaDonna Humphrey because she gossiped with someone. Otherwise, I'd be on the chopping block. He would have exposed me long ago. And a defamation lawsuit isn't really something he would cover. When I DM'd him to basically say, can't wait to listen, interested in seeing what you're talking about, he told me that there was a lot to the story, and the reason he was covering it was that this was someone who was working in true crime, not just true crime, but in our specific field of podcasting, and he didn't think she was a safe person with what he had learned about her. And we've been here before with people in this field. Billy Jensen is the first name that popped into my mind as he was accused of sexually harassing someone who was working for the Exactly Right Network, which is owned by one of the hosts of My Favorite Murder. After the accusations were made public due to a lawsuit, some others came forward about their experiences with him. Rebecca Lavoie from Crime Writers On mentioned on Twitter that there was a bit of a whisper network about him, which I can kind of confirm. I did hear people call him creepy but no one gave additional context or specific accusations of why they were saying that. From what I understand, Billy Jensen, when he was faced with the fallout of what happened, sought treatment for mental health and alcohol abuse, which is really the best case scenario, right? When someone is held accountable and faces the hurt they have inflicted on others, they then take steps to fix it. And if that is what happened with LaDonna, the pretend podcast season would have been on something else entirely. Unlike with Billy, I had not heard anything about LaDonna within the podcast space except that she had a falling out with that other podcaster. And I only knew about that because a friend of mine was involved. And that's probably because there is a big difference between LaDonna Humphrey and Billy Jensen. And that's that Billy was a big name in the industry. He had the career that LaDonna was working towards TV, documentaries, podcasting, books. So, of course, people talked about him more because he was higher profile. It wasn't until I listened to the pretend season that I got the details on what Javier was talking about. I found out why her co-host Alicia left their podcast. I learned that a rumor I had heard about Maura Murray's father, that he tried to control the investigation and the tips that came in, originated with LaDonna Humphrey. Her nonprofit at the time was offering a large reward in the case which is why they even had contact. LaDonna's proof that Fred did this was an email that he supposedly sent her, except the header of the email indicated that LaDonna was the one who sent the message to Fred Murray. So in other words, it looked fake. A rumor I had been hearing for years before I even knew LaDonna's name had originated with her. And as a side note, it did make me think about how we hear rumors, but we never consider who was the actual source. Anyway, those are just two stories on the podcast. There are many more, including Anthony Christopher's. 
I met Anthony at a mixer for the True Crime Podcast Festival that was in Denver this past July. We started talking, and we didn't stop talking until probably one or two in the morning. So not only was he gracious enough to talk to me for hours back in July, he was willing to sit down and tell all of you what we talked about and what had happened to him, at least part of it, here on Crime Lines. His whole story, start to finish, could be a podcast season by itself, believe it or not, but it is just one piece of a much bigger story. Javier covers accusations against LaDonna Humphrey that span from her young adulthood through the action she has taken within the true crime world, with the Maura Murray case as one example, but also the Melissa Witt case. And then he continues with things she has done in her career working with nonprofits, which includes her current work as a director of a sober living house. So with that introduction, I do want to go ahead and play the interview with Anthony Christopher now. And at the end of that, I will play the clip from the first episode of Pretend, Who's Afraid of LaDonna Humphrey, and your assignment is to search Pretend in your favorite podcast app and start listening to those 16 episodes that are out now. So for my listeners, you know, in the introduction, I've gone into a little bit about your lawsuit, but how did you meet LaDonna Humphrey? How did your paths even cross? So for many years, I was involved in the foster care system in the state of Arkansas. So a big part of what my focus was, was helping to reform the laws surrounding long-term housing for children in foster care. So I had helped to grow this nonprofit from its inception almost um, and became their executive director, where I helped to not only reform laws in foster care, but we had actually developed the first ever long-term sustainable housing for children in foster care where we gave particular focus to reuniting siblings that had been separated through the system. So we developed this beautiful 10 and a half acre plot of land. We built six bedroom homes that would house nine children each. I mean, at one point, we even had a sibling group of 13 that had been reunited on campus that had been separated through the whole state. So it became very known in my community that my passion was foster care. My passion was advocacy and So one of the areas that I felt like were really struggling were when it came to therapeutic services for these kids in need. One of the things that we have to remember is that a lot of these children, when they come into foster care, not only are they dealing with trauma, but they may have educational delays. They may have other delays that were brought upon. Maybe they were born addicted to drugs or alcohol. So there are areas that if we can catch them early on in their childhood, we can help bring them up to speed. So that, you know, when they go into their adult life, that they're not struggling as badly as they would have been had they not had the good quality services. And so what I found in my time in foster care was that there really wasn't a place that was doing that and that was um, really giving these children good quality services. Unfortunately, they were seen as just a Medicaid payment. And, you know, Medicaid is the lowest payable reimbursement source. And so oftentimes they were treated as such. So as really an offshoot of what I was doing in the nonprofit realm, I decided to start a pediatric therapy clinic. It was the first ever in the state of Arkansas to be a one-stop shop for all your therapeutic needs. So if you think about it, we did it. Um, Speech, occupational, physical therapy, mental health counseling, developmental therapy. We, We had med management on site, autism testing. And so really it became a a phenomenal resource, not only for foster care children, but for families in need. And so very quickly, LaDonna um, came across my path and moved her children into therapeutic services with us. And uh, within a short amount of time, I found LaDonna spending hours upon hours a week just hanging out at the clinic. I know I've had kids um, receive early, you know, birth to age three and then early education services. And it is, as a parent, you're sitting in that waiting room a lot. And I know LaDonna has several children. So, yeah, I can see how she was there pretty frequently. What led from her sitting in the waiting room to her having a job at the clinic or at your facility? You know, it's funny. When I when I look back at things now, I realize that very early on, LaDonna was preying on me. You know, she was there, yes, probably for services, but... I think that she had an ulterior motive there, and little did I know I was going to be her next victim. So what happened was she really just started to uh, come in, really had these kind of woe as me stories, 
talking about how her board president would come on to her and make these sexual advances towards her, um, that she felt like it was a matter of time before he was just going to try to get rid of her if she wouldn't take him up on these sexual advances. And lo and behold, within a short couple of weeks, she was terminated from her job. And she contacted me late that evening on a Friday evening. And she told me, look, I've been terminated. The adoption care worker on the case hates me. I'm in the middle of my fifth and final adoption from foster care. If he finds that I'm without income, he's going to halt the adoption in its tracks. Well, anyone that knows me knows that my passion is foster care. So I'm not going to allow that to happen. So we took a, we took a chance. And I, you know, being still a very new small clinic at the time and growing, we created a position and I, and I hired her as my community outreach director with the intention that she would work with doctor's offices, our preschool and daycare partners, uh, the schools that we worked with in uh, the school districts each week. And so that was it. So she was terminated from her job on a Friday. And that Monday, she became my community outreach director. And one of the things that I find interesting about that position is it's actually something she's pretty good at. She is a nonstop, particularly self-promoter with her books and her documentaries and stuff. But there are so many articles of the various nonprofits she's worked on where she is being quoted because she gets herself in front of whoever will listen. So honestly, I don't think it was I know that in hindsight, it was a bad idea. But I think with her skill set and what she is talented at, it seems like a good fit or it should have been. Oh, absolutely. I mean, from the beginning, I thought, wow, this would be a natural fit. This will really help us build awareness, get our name out there, strengthen partnerships. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, at face value, it seemed like it would be a perfect fit for both parties. So it went south. Um, I'm, I know I'm just going to tell people to listen to the Pretend Podcast because it gets pretty, um, there's, there's multiple layers of what happens next. But she ends up working for you for a few months before you terminated her, right? Just over 90 days. All of this over 90 days of work. You know, had I known that 90 something days of work would have caused six years of harm and grief, I, I can tell you I would have never, <laughs> I would have never gone on that journey. So she gets fired. And how soon after she leaves the job do you start getting harassment? Within days, my whole world just spirals. Um, doctor partners, referral sources, daycares and preschools stop picking up the phone. They stop referring. I'm having therapists quit, which I had next to no turnover rate in my clinic. It just became an instant state of paranoia and grief in the clinic because Nobody really knew what was going on. We just knew that everything was going south very quickly, ultimately to find that, you know, here's LaDonna on the back end sending hundreds of spoof emails and texts to everybody she can think in an attempt to ruin our name and the trajectory of the company and the services that we were offering to the community. And that soon snowballed. Ev I mean, it wasn't like in a fit of rage she shot off some emails. This continued for far longer than she worked for you. Absolutely. You know, we went and uh, in October of that year, this is October 2018, I had her served with a cease and desist in an attempt to get the harassment to stop. We all knew uh, very quickly that LaDonna had been the person that was behind me. She really laughed it off. She continued the harassment. She continued to really kind of stalk me. And uh, it was then later that I realized that it wasn't going to stop unless um, I took civil action. And so, you know, there were two parts that really happened to this. One, I contacted the Bentonville Police Department who opened an investigation on her for harassment. And I believe that we were very close to having her charged. But the downside to that situation was that I had just filed the civil lawsuit. And the moment I filed the civil lawsuit, the Benton County prosecutor decided that it would be best just to let the civil courts handle it. And they closed the case for harassment. So I ended up proceeding with the lawsuit, which lasted uh, just shy of about three days uh, of a year that that lawsuit took place. Civil lawsuits take so long. But one of the things that came up in this lawsuit specifically was uh, digital forensics 
because a lot of what she was sending, she obviously wasn't using her own email address. She was using spoofed addresses, spoofed phone numbers, fake phone numbers you get from TextNow or whatever service she was using. And you had to do some investigation of your own to figure out what was happening. I did. You know, uh, one of the things that was requested in through the civil lawsuit is we had a recording with her in Bentonville Police Department where she admits to being this individual behind the spoof messages that particularly in this situation were harassing my mother. I can't imagine harassing somebody in general, but then harassing their mother just seems to take it to a whole new level. But I knew that that we had to get her device. We had to be able to see what was on the device and what she was doing because this was just the tip of the iceberg. So the court awards me access to hire a third party electronic discovery expert that would come in, mirror image, all of the information off of the phone that would then be used in the civil case. LaDonna waited till the 11th hour to hand this over. Consequently enough, at the 11th hour, 911 is called. They state that LaDonna's vehicle has been broken into. Inside LaDonna's vehicle is her purse, and inside of her purse is her cell phone. And that because her cell phone was in that purse, the purse was stolen, she is not able to hand over her cell phone for electronic discovery. But then adds one more layer to the fold in stating that they see my SUV leaving the scene of the crime. So within a short two weeks, I'm in Benton County Sheriff's Office being criminally interrogated as to my whereabouts on this date that LaDonna states that I stole her cell phone. She basically is accusing you of stealing her cell phone when you were going to get it pretty much the next day anyway. That's 100% correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I was correct on that. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, she she then went on this whole... Uh, let, let, me, let me say this as well. Not only did she say the cell phone was stolen, not only did she say that they saw my SUV leaving the scene of the crime... But then they wait conveniently almost 60 days to tell the Benton County Court that her phone is stolen and that the Apple ID account is no longer recoverable. Why? Because everything had been deleted, of which her defense was that there was some mysterious hacker that hacked into her phone, hacked into her Gmail, hacked into her iCloud account, and I was this mysterious hacker. But you wanted that information. So if you hacked into those, you would have just taken the information, not deleted it. It makes absolutely no sense. No. And so, you know, we went on this whole uh, journey of electronic discovery. We started to subpoena phone records from AT&T, who was her cell phone provider at the time. We uh, subpoenaed Cox to be able to get IP addresses. And, you know, what we find out is pretty remarkable. I mean, we knew, right? Like, we knew at face value, this has to be LaDonna. Nobody else would do this to somebody and nobody's life would be crumbling this quickly after a termination if it weren't somebody like LaDonna Humphrey. And so what we end up finding, smoking gun number one, is the Cox IP address comes back that the sunshine elements at gmail.com that was sending these heinous, disgusting emails about myself and my clinic came from none other than LaDonna's new employer's IP address. And number two, when we look at the at and records, I start to examine all of the different components of the records that we were given. And one of those is an area that they call the IMSI number, which is a unique serial number given to the cell phone device. What we find is that shortly after the phone is quote unquote stolen, LaDonna is found to have popped that SIM card out of the stolen device and into the brand new cell phone that she buys less than 24 hours later. Look, I'm not, I'm not, a, a, I'm not a genius when it comes to these type of things, but I would be led to believe that if somebody is going to steal a cell phone and somebody is going to steal a purse after <laughs> breaking into somebody's car, they sure as heck are not going to leave a SIM card laying around for LaDonna to upload her contacts and data to into her new phone. You brought all this to the judge who found her to be in contempt for this, correct? They found her guilty of five different counts of contempt, destruction of evidence, and violating the temporary restraining and preservation order that was in place. So this was a civil case, which is why I was surprised to find out she ended up spending 10 days over five different weekends locked up in jail over it. I mean, most people don't go to jail in a civil case. 
That's exactly right, Charlie. I think that, you know, in this case, this was such a heinous um, reaction and response to a civil case of what she had done. The judge felt like she had to show LaDonna that she was not messing around. You know, when, when this happened, you got to think through through an entire year's course, LaDonna continued to play with the court system, destroy evidence, hide evidence, attack, frame me for crimes that I never committed, all to then be caught red-handed in front of the judge. The judge felt like she had to make an example. So she was given two days for each disturbance uh, in violation of the court order. How did you get in touch with Javier? In March of this year, uh, I was in contact with Arkansas Business, which is one of the leading publications for the business journals in Arkansas. And they had uh, wanted to feature a story on my journey of what had happened with LaDonna Humphrey regarding my lawsuit and the $3.57 million that I was awarded against her in court. And so following that article, um, we really had a lot of success in finding other victims and survivors that started to come forward uh, that had their own dealings with LaDonna. And so through that process, you know, more and more people started coming forward. And for me, I think the biggest shock was that, you know, somebody that that is sued and found guilty of malicious harm, injury, intent, you know, you would think that a that a almost four million dollar lawsuit would put a stop to them. And Remarkably, the the opposite effect had happened, and I had found that since my lawsuit with with LaDonna Humphrey, more and more victims were surfacing that were victims after my lawsuit. People that were being attacked during the civil litigation, people that were attacked after the civil litigation, and then people that were um, in the process of, of an ongoing attack by LaDonna. And so, you know, we decided as a group that it was time to really get the story out. And it was time to unite these individuals as survivors and no longer uh, consider ourselves as victims, but to step forward in unison as survivors. And so one of the other survivors uh, had reached out to me and she said, look, there's this guy, Javier Leva. He's got this podcast and the pretend podcast is, is solely focused on exposing individuals like this. So I reached out to Javier and Really, kind of the rest is history. He took an interest in the case and started doing his own investigative work into it and decided that he felt like it would be a good fit for his show. Yeah, and he moved pretty quickly on it, too. Oh, my gosh. There were so many hours. I mean, I, I can't even tell you the amount of hours he spent reading legal court documents, uh, interviewing other survivors, uh, reviewing evidence to make sure that what he was reporting on was accurate. I mean, he, he definitely, I mean, it was more than a full-time job for him to take on this case. And before Per 10 Podcast, your story is really the only one that was out there. I actually, if you want to know how I found out about this story is before that article or around the time that article came out, I was Facebook friends with LaDonna. And she started posting, people talk about things that they don't know what they're doing and hit pieces and this and that. Just, I was like, what in the world is going on? She's posting all these vague quotes. And I was like, all right, something's going on. So I Googled her name and of course it popped up. So that's how I found out who you were. <laughs> that's how I found out about this lawsuit. And I did not know pretend radio was, I still call it pretend radio. I don't even think Javier calls it pretend radio anymore. I've been a listener since the beginning. So that tells you how long I've known Javier, but I didn't know Pretend was coming. So I only knew your story. And so when episode one drops and it's talking about Alicia, which was LaDonna's co-host who I've met, I was surprised. And Javier told me, um, you know, not to leak a DM, but he told me, just wait, wait, so much more is coming. And every time he put out an episode, he'd get contacted by someone else. Yeah, it was honestly, it has been an absolute whirlwind. You know, LaDonna, through this process, through the civil court case, you know, I I believed, I mean, that I was the first to ever go after her publicly, you know, and then we later find out that there was actually another victim, Kim Pascalini out of Phoenix, that was actually the first to sue LaDonna, but mine was the first to really gain a lot of public attention. And so, you know, after I won this lawsuit, the one thing I kept thinking through the process was you know, she is too good at this. I cannot be the first that she has done this to. And lo and behold, I didn't realize that there are this whole treasure trove of people that have their own stories that have been victimized by this woman that were on the outskirts watching as I was battling this very public battle with her. And they only ended up coming forward after I won the lawsuit. 
Javier titling this Who's Afraid of LaDonna Humphrey was very smart because it it really explains what you're going to hear. There were so many people who had been harassed, but for one reason or another, even though they knew or suspected LaDonna was behind it, they didn't feel like they could come forward. Either they didn't want their loved one's case dragged into it, or they didn't want to deal with more harassment or like I mean, you had your mom getting harassed. They didn't want to invite more into their lives. And so they were afraid of what LaDonna would do. But then once you all got together and started comparing notes, you realize that two people who do not know each other, one of them's out in the islands, one is in Arkansas, and they're getting harassing messages from the same phone number. And their only connection is LaDonna Humphrey. The only connection is LaDonna Humphrey. That's right. And I mean, we have been able to span several survivors that have received these messages. I mean, I want to say that there's been at least seven numbers we have linked between five uh, of her different victims. And the only, like you said, the only common denominator is LaDonna. And there has been, there have been some attempts, you know, I'm, I'm very much a both sides of the story kind of person. There have been some attempts by some of her friends to defend her a bit, but they really haven't been very, you know, substantial. It's a lot of, she didn't do it and I trust her, which is great. Stand by your friend. But um, as far as people out there listening who are like, well, I want to hear the other side of the story, you'll be disappointed because it has not really been given. Well, and Charlie, I think it's important to also note, I mean, we are, since the, the airing of the pretend podcast, we have now clocked over 40 victims of LaDonna Humphreys. That's a lot of people. 40 people that all are saying the same thing that apparently are liars. And so for me, it's, it's really hard to understand how people are continuing to back her, even though it's a small minority. The people that are backing her are people that really are just not looking at the facts of the case. And, you know, four bogus felony counts of Medicaid fraud by the Arkansas Attorney General's office because LaDonna was able to manipulate a young, naive investigator into believing I had somehow committed $12,000 in fraud. And this individual never audited, never investigated, never interviewed my billers, never interviewed my staff, believed LaDonna at face value, went as far as to charge me for four felonies. Which you've been completely cleared of. I was completely cleared almost a year ago. Uh, I, let's see, October 13th will be one year that I've been completely cleared of all the charges. So I met you at True Crime Podcast Festival. Um, I sat down next to my friend Eric, and he was talking to someone else. So I just started talking to you instead. And we talked for hours. And I just, I cannot believe everything you went through. And then at the end of it, you're like, okay, we need to make sure nobody else gets hurt by this woman. Yeah. You know, I mean, the the journey has been a a painful journey. And it's been one of, of a lot of lessons I think I've had to learn. But you know, through this process, Charlie, it's been very much that. It's that, you know, I sacrificed a lot. I went through a lot of heartache to defend myself against this woman and to bring uh, to the limelight what she has done. And I won't rest until she either stops or she's put behind bars. Do you think pretend has moved the needle on holding LaDonna accountable? I absolutely believe that the Pretend Podcast has been amazing for awareness where LaDonna's concerned. You know, I think uh, we just checked just recently. I want to say that this season of the Pretend Podcast has just surpassed 800,000 downloads. So there's a lot of attention and, you know, its inception started Memorial Day weekend. And so I definitely think that, you know, we're finding more and more victims of LaDonna's over the, the span of 30 plus years that are coming forward because now they feel empowered. Javier gave an amazing platform to tell the stories of these people that have been victimized that may not have ever been given that opportunity. So, you know, I I say not only on behalf of myself, but the other victims, we are so grateful for Javier and what he's done and what he continues to do to shed light um, on the behaviors and the actions of LaDonna. I know he's wrapping up the season, but if there is more that comes out, he will, you know, go back and revisit because he's done that with other seasons. And I think that's one of the things I like about Pretend is that he's really here to expose 
real people who are pretending to be someone else. And if he has to double back on that to to bring everyone up to speed on what someone is doing, he will do that. So I have no doubt it, this is not the end of what we're going to hear. Yeah, you know, one of the things that's amazing about Javier is that when you meet him and you really go through a journey like this with him, you know, he's not just um, a podcast producer and host that's just trying to to sell an episode. You know, he's really committed. He, he's got a lot of love and a lot of support and a lot of empathy for the people that have gone through what they've gone through. And when he's there and he's committed, he's there for the long haul. And so I can tell you that he checks up on the other victims, the survivors. He makes sure that they're doing well. He follows up, you know. And so uh, I will tell you that that he's been very healing for a lot of people. And I think that we will find that there are going to be more things coming to light in the very near future. I know behind the scenes podcaster side of things, Javier put his neck out to do this season. He has been openly accused by someone LaDonna is friends with of basically cannibalizing within the podcast community. And the warning has gone out. Who's next? Who's Javier going to target next? And I confess to Javier already that I do have, I rolled a stop sign about 15 years ago and I do have that ticket on my record. I paid it. But if he wants to expose me, it's going to be a pretty boring season for sure. But I think that this idea that he's attacking another podcaster is completely off base. And I think the only people who may give that credence are people who don't know Javier. Most of us in the industry have known Javier for many, many years, and his integrity has been evident over 15, 16 seasons already. So we know what to expect. And so I think Javier's the right person to tell this story because one, he's fearless. And two, he has the reputation to back up what he's doing and he's saying. Other podcasters out there, unless you're scamming people, you have nothing to worry about. Yeah, I agree 100%. You know, I think that the reason that this had to come to light is, you know, Charlie, you know this as well as I do. The missing persons community, the true crime community, is one of the most vulnerable populations that anybody can insert themselves into. Absolutely. To go into that community and to prey on that community and to victimize victim families, to me, is just mind-blowing. We know several that have been victimized, one of them being the case of Mara Murray, Julie Murray. The Murray family are victims of LaDonna Humphrey. I told Javier after Julie was on the podcast that I knew the rumor that got started by LaDonna Humphrey. I did not realize that the email header was backwards, so it was obviously a forged email. I didn't know that, and I didn't know it was LaDonna. But I knew that rumor because it had grown its own legs with some help. But I had no idea, and I met LaDonna and had no idea she had any connection at all to Julie Murray. Yeah, it's remarkable the amount of lives that she's inserted herself into. I mean, you know, the Murray family paid a very heavy price uh, for allowing LaDonna to step in. And and I think that that's a price that they continue to pay for. And I hope that since the pretend podcast and setting the record straight and providing the actual proof and evidence, you know, people are able to see that uh, the Murray family are just an, a, a kind, loving family that want to find answers to what happened to Mara, just like these other people. You know, LaDonna has inserted herself into the Missy Witt case. She has sens sensationalized items um, and key facts that never should have been given the importance and focus they are. You know, we know that she has mishandled case documents from Fort Smith Police Department. You know, th this is a woman that should not have any place or platform in true crime or missing persons. And I think for those reasons alone, what Javier has done has saved future victim families and other podcasters that may fall victim to LaDonna's ways. Absolutely. So I think the aftermath of the podcast will be overall a positive, but I'm sure there's been negatives coming with increased harassment or continued harassment. And certainly from what I understand, hasn't slowed LaDonna down in contacting people. No, it's funny. You know, she, she claims that she doesn't do these things and that this is all just, you know, I, I'm I'm so angry with her and I want revenge. And, and none of these things are about anger or revenge. This is about awareness. And so 
Of course. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're going to look at this and we're going to see that, you know, from a woman that's standing there saying she's done nothing wrong, but out of the same side uh, is, is going and attacking Javier. I mean, Javier has never, in all of these seasons of pretend, has never received spoof, harassing text or emails. And guess who is being harassed now? Javier. Call it a coincidence or call it LaDonna Humphrey. I think I know which one I'll call it. One thing I think my listeners, when they listen to the season of pretend, um, I would implore them to pay attention to patterns of behavior because that is consistent whether the person is someone she worked for, someone she volunteered with, or someone she is supposedly helping through the nonprofit she currently works with. The stories are so similar because the patterns are similar. And even something you said at the beginning of when we were talking, she was accusing her boss of sexual harassment. I don't necessarily want to get into rumors I've heard behind the scenes or whatever, but I, you know, I've heard that she has made comments in the past about other people wanting to be with her sexually, including podcasters, or at least one podcast. I should say podcaster. I only know about one, and that's just a rumor. Well, I can tell you, I've seen the the text messages where LaDonna has made those statements, you know, and and in LaDonna's eyes, everybody's in love with her. I mean, look, I'm Charlie, let's call it what it is. I'm a gay male. You know, I I have text messages where LaDonna has sent my my picture out to people saying I'm in love with her and that I want to quote unquote, switch teams to be with her. I mean, it couldn't be further from the truth. Creepy thing for her to say. I just... It's not a pattern of fraud or spoofing or harassing people, but it is something that I have heard, you know, three times has been said by her about someone wanting her sexually. It's a weird pattern. And it's just everything seems to be patterns. It feels like every time she's in a new situation, she just starts repeating what she did in the last situation. And you so far, well, I mean, I know Kim, to give my listeners some background, Kim had a nonprofit dedicated to missing adults. LaDonna had a nonprofit dedicated mostly to the same thing, and they started to combine them and it went south. And so they had a lawsuit. But in the end of that lawsuit, I don't really feel like LaDonna was held accountable, except that she had to go through a lawsuit. With yours, I feel that's the first time she's ever faced serious resistance. That's right. Yeah. And I I was very uh, determined that I was going to see that thing through just as I'll continue to see anything through now. You know, one of the things that I have in my favor is I have a permanent restraining order against LaDonna. LaDonna has attempted to utilize her surrogates to harass and, and write disgusting, heinous things about me, spread untruths. What she doesn't realize is by doing those things that you know, she's in violation of that court order and she will be back in front of Judge Duncan in Benton County Court here very soon, having to explain her behaviors and why she's done that. But you're right. I mean, at the end of the day, Everything is about a pattern for LaDonna. The the tactics that LaDonna has used in 1993 with her first victims that we know about are still the same patterns of attack she's utilizing today in 2024. It's really shocking how long it's gone on. I feel like, you know, a lawsuit is so painful. I mean, people will hesitate to sue over things like this, and I understand that, but I think it's amazing that you went through it and that you're continuing. I know she's appealing the... She's appealing the monetary judgment, and you may have to go through that portion again, but hopefully it'll be smoother sailing. Yeah, I think, I think we're in the home stretch here now. You know, the, the thing about LaDonna is LaDonna's never going to stop until she's put behind bars. And so I, where my story goes, my chapter's almost closed with her, but I will continue to remain to be here, to be a voice, to be a support to be whatever I can be to the other victims and survivors that come forward. Because look, I mean, at 40, 42 and counting survivors that we know about, we know we're just scratching the surface. There are many, many more that are out there that are listening, that are hoping to find the courage to come forward. And, you know, my only message to them is that one, there's healing and knowing the other survivors, knowing that you haven't been through it alone. And two, um, we're stronger and we're more powerful in numbers. Heads up, this episode has depictions of deviant sexual content. You should not listen to this without headphones. You should not listen to this with children in the room. You've been warned. Mm 
when I was really young. I used to live in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon, and I had accepted this job as a personal assistant to a man who was a pornography producer. It was 2010, and Alicia Lockhart was only 24 years old. To my knowledge, when I accepted this position, his niche was clown pornography. Clown? Clown? I don't know if it was the streaming. Did you say clown? Or... Clown, like birthday oh, party, okay. clown, you know, like <laughs> entertainment, cl- children entertainment, wow. clown. Typically, when I interview someone, I have a prepared list of questions. I have an idea of what the story's about. This was not the case when I interviewed Alicia Lockhart. The clown porn thing completely caught me off guard. When I went for my job interview, there was a, like, honest to God, clown pornography being filmed, like, in the background of my job interview to be this man's personal assistant. So it was like, it looked legitimate. It was weird. But then again, Alicia Lockhart was a goth girl with neon green hair. The clown porn thing was weird, but. She went along with it anyway. You can see I'm kind of alternative or creative. I didn't bother me in that moment. I was like, okay, cool. This is an interesting kind of office work. I'll, I'll take this. But when I showed up for my first shift of work, he asked me if I would be comfortable like starring in any of the movies that he made. And I told him no, that I didn't want to do that. A few days later, he did call me and said he had like a really strange request. He had a a strange request come in. You see, the director wasn't just into clown pornography. He was also directing death fetish videos. Kind of like snuff films where someone is killed but no one really dies. These fake murder videos are as disgusting as you imagine. It's hard to imagine someone actually getting aroused by watching someone stabbed, drowned, or strangled to death. He wanted a model who would just like lay still on a morgue slab. And he said that he needed to do like slow pans up and down of their body and that that's all it would be. Like no touching, no other people, just lay there naked. So I was a little uncomfortable with it, but he was offering me like $500 to do that. I was like 22. It seemed easy. He said that nobody would ever see it. It was like going on a CD in somebody's private collection. There was no contract, no consent form, just his word. And Alicia, she just went along with it. I showed up to the filming location like maybe a week later and... It was actually his house, and he was wanting to film this in the basement of his house. He fed me lunch before we filmed. Nothing fancy, just sandwiches and lemonade. Also, they weren't alone either. In fact, the director's girlfriend and son were in the room. She was a little nervous, and the kid was within earshot the whole time, so they avoided talking about this whole death fetish shoot that was about to happen. After lunch, they walk downstairs to the basement. Now, this is where things start getting a little foggy for Alicia. I asked her, how did she get the mark across her neck? It it made it look like she was strangled. Was it drawn on or was it something else? Alicia says she doesn't remember. And he had this Mickey Mouse watch in it. And he was like, I need you to put this watch on for me before we start filming. It's like the most important part of the film. So put it on. A Mickey Mouse watch? That's creepy. And he reiterated that it was super important that the dead girl be wearing the Mickey Mouse watch in the video. So I put it on. And at this point, like, my memory changes pretty drastically from being like a full-blown movie to being like I can barely grasp little moments from that point. I've unfortunately watched the video. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, well, uh, it looks like it's our guy. The director was also the star of the video, and he played the part of a CSI investigator examining the crime scene. I'm in a hurry because I got another one right after this. Like I said, I'm going to get her back to to the field office ASAP. Alicia is laying on the floor with her back propped on the sofa. Her head is tilted back, and her mouth and eyes were wide open. 
She's posing as a corpse. He eventually grabs Alicia's lifeless body, lifts her up, and carries her off screen. I'm gonna get you down these stairs. In the next scene, Alicia is laying on a platform of some sort. The director examines her entire body. You just keep getting hotter and hotter. I'm sorry for having to describe this in such great detail, but this next part is kind of important. The man slowly undresses Alicia. She's completely naked, except for this Mickey Mouse watch. Maybe it's because she was instructed to keep her eyes open and fixed to one spot. Maybe it's the trauma of being exploited, or maybe it was something else. But Alicia says that she doesn't remember much about this day. And obviously, this was not a comfortable or a normal experience for me anyways. So I kind of just felt like maybe I disassociated or something. Like, it was uncomfortable. Severe bruising on the inner thighs. But I just kind of had put that memory out of my mind. It was a really long time ago. Like I said, it was 2010 and Alicia was just 24 years old. And it happened to come back up into conversation in 2021 with my sister. And when I told her about this experience, she was like, this is super creepy. (laughs) Why did they want a video of a dead girl with a Mickey Mouse watch? Where do you think that video wound up? Like, what do you know what it looked like? Did you ever watch it? So we had this conversation about it and she ended up Googling Mickey Mouse watch plus murder. And that's when they got a hit. There was a case out of Arkansas where a 21-year-old woman named Melissa Witt went missing. They found her body six weeks later. And so when she did that Google search, Melissa Witt is what came up. Because um, that is a detail about that case. Melissa Witt, her watch was taken from her body after she was murdered. And they've always kind of believed that the murderer might have kept it as a trophy. At this point, I was really creeped out. I didn't think that it was necessarily related, but it seemed random. Like, it just seemed like such a strange... It's a detail. Mm Mm-hmm. It's a detail that's very specific, right? Like the morgue, the morgue thing, I could kind of understand. But the Mickey Mouse watch, that just seems very specific. Right. And like, it could not be related at all. Could just be a coincidence. But I figured I will just let law enforcement decide that because I figured they could probably find the guy I used to work for and talk to him about it. Could this fetish porn director be linked to the Melissa Witt case? Does the Mickey Mouse watch have any significance? They thought maybe this information could be a new lead in this now 30-year-old cold case. And so that's why I called in a tip. I really just expected that I would have a phone call with one or two people and that would be it. But the first person that I spoke with was LaDonna Humphrey. LaDonna Humphrey. Remember that name because she is very important to the story. Listen, I've tried to sum up this story quickly, an elevator pitch, and every time I fail. When my friends ask me, hey, what's this new series about? I'm lost for words because there's just no simple way to tell the story in just a few minutes. So how can I tell it here and where do I start? I'm about to retell the story the same way I learned about it and completely out of order. By the end of this thing, you're going to need a suspect board like the ones you see in the movies. I've conducted more than 20 interviews and counting. You're going to hear some pretty far-fetched allegations from a lot of different people. Actually, from complete strangers. None of these people I've spoken to have anything in common. Except they cross paths with one particular woman. There's a lot of he said, she said in the story. And I'm going to do my best to prove and disprove every one of these claims. This series is going to be a long one. I can't even predict how many episodes it will be because it's unfolding as you're hearing this right now. Yeah, it's going to be one of those. But by the end of this series, hopefully I've done a good enough job for you to make up your own mind and find out why so many people are afraid of LaDonna Humphrey. I'm Javier Leva, and this is Pretend. Stories about real people pretending to be someone else.
Let's pick up where I left off. Alicia Lockhart first met true crime author and podcaster LaDonna Humphrey in 2021. I actually called in a tip to the Melissa Witt tip line. She runs an unsolved murder tip line for uh, a case from 1994 in Arkansas. Tomorrow marks 29 years since the abduction and murder of Melissa Witt. LaDonna Humphrey made a name for herself by covering the Melissa Witt disappearance. She's written books, recorded podcasts, and even produced her own Amazon Prime documentary on the case. Melissa Witt was a 19-year-old from Fort Smith, Arkansas, who vanished from a bowling alley in 1994. She was missing for weeks until they discovered her naked body laying on a rock in the Ozarks National Forest. Her head was badly decomposed, but investigators were able to determine that she was strangled to death, just like Alicia portrayed in the fetish film. And her Mickey Mouse watch, along with all her other possessions, gone. Here's LaDonna Humphrey describing meeting Alicia for the first time on her podcast, Extinguished. Alicia Lockhart came to me via email with um, a tip in the Wit case. She had been involved in um, a death fetish film. She had been asked to pretend to be a, a girl that had been strangled to death. And the producer asked her to wear a Mickey Mouse watch. So she reached out to me and we got to know each other. And that's how I discovered the world, the underbelly of the internet, death fetish. And that did spark this year-long undercover investigation. LaDonna wanted to know who commissioned the film, who was the producer, what did any of this have to do with Melissa Witt? And she was very, very interested in what had happened to me and if it could be related to Melissa's case. You know, she followed up with me a few times. In case you're wondering, yes, Alicia did report her experience to the Fort Smith Police Department in Arkansas. And she had a series of phone calls with the detectives, but eventually that went nowhere. But it was LaDonna who kept following up. And she pretty much stayed in touch with me every day from that point on. She needed more information about the man that I used to work for, the video. So I agreed to help her as much as I could. And I started looking for the last name of that man. She couldn't remember it at the time. I mean, after all, this video was shot in 2010. And I was still searching for like a clown pornographer in Portland, Oregon, and I just couldn't find him. And it was really um, like really racking my brain. But one night I just typed in morgue porn and hit enter. And um, what I found was really horrifying. I, I had no idea that was like a popular kind of pornography. Alicia scoured thousands of death fetish videos. I found a lot of videos immediately of that nature. And most of them were made by this man that I had worked for during that time. He called himself Chris Corner almost like a play on Chris Coroner. I saw these thumbnails with him in them, and I discovered that that was basically his bread and butter. As I was scrolling through these images, I found a screenshot of myself, which was really hard for me since I had been told that it wasn't something that was going to be sold on a website. So... That was a huge discovery. I was able to give LaDonna the man's name, his company name, his website, and the, you know, the whole entire video for her to review. And I did end up watching the video. As I said before, it's really hard for me to remember most of what else happened there. So I felt like that was something I needed to do for myself. And I did watch it. And there's a lot that goes on in the video that I did not consent to. I was uh, touched inappropriately. It's my opinion that I may have been drugged in some way during the meal that we shared beforehand, but I don't have any proof of that. We don't need to go into any graphic details, but let's just say there was no intercourse. Either way, Alicia said this wasn't what she signed up for. And thank you for hanging in there, folks, because that was as graphic as the series is going to get. We needed to talk about it because it's going to come back up at some point in the series. So 
We're past it now. Let's get back to the story. At this point, I was, again, working mostly with LaDonna, not with law enforcement much after the initial interviews. And what LaDonna was telling me was that the police were working on it. They were very interested. They felt like he could have been involved. She wanted me to keep helping her research this man and find anything else I could find out about him online during that time period, potentially figure out who the client was that ordered the video, things like that. She wanted me and her to work on together. Now I really feel like that should have been something law enforcement was doing rather than LaDonna Humphrey. But she sort of explained that away by saying that they were very busy and this was a 30-year-old case. And, you know, that does make sense that if she could help out in some way, maybe they would just do the last part of the investigation or the important stuff. And she also had told me that she was a licensed private investigator and that she had access to the case file, could go into the station. And I know that some detective on that case did give her access like that. It was hard to believe in the beginning, although we did determine after the first interview that we felt like what Alicia was telling us, that she at least believed it to be true. You know, she was always very consistent with the story. Alicia was caught in the moment. She truly believed that her experience could shed new light into the Melissa Witt case. The Mickey Mouse watch, the strangled girl, either the director or whoever commissioned this film might be the killer trying to relive a twisted fantasy. I thought that I was helping not just her, but Melissa Witt, the police. LaDonna was actually paying me to help at this point. She had sent me money through Venmo to keep doing the research that she needed done about this guy that I used to work for. And so I I started doing quite a bit of research, not only about him, but like that whole industry. And to be honest with you, I was I was appalled by it and fascinated by it. It kind of became like a moral mission for me at some point. Especially, too, because I did wonder, in all these thousands of videos that I was seeing, were any of the other women in these videos, um, you know, potentially being trafficked or were they drugged in the videos? Or I just had a lot of questions. Were any of them dead, actually, and not just pretending to be dead? So I got completely swallowed whole (laughs) by, by this memory that turned into... A kind of a mission. And LaDonna felt the same about it too. So we sort of embarked on a mission together to learn more about the communities, about the laws, about who these people were behind their screen names and monikers. Like who who's really making these videos? How many of them are there? So that that was a pretty time-consuming mission, and it led to us writing a book together and starting a podcast. And through that process, Alicia and I said, we got to write a book about this. This is so unbelievable. We've got to document it. And they did. In 2022, Alicia and LaDonna co-wrote a book titled Strangled. And then as soon as the book came out, we also launched a, a podcast called Deep Dark Secrets. After Alicia teamed up with LaDonna Humphrey and started to investigate the death fetish community, that's when the harassment started. She became the target of a person going by the name of Fetish Master. Messages to my personal cell phone number, mostly at nighttime, about how I was in danger and that I needed to stop sticking my nose where it didn't belong and that whoever was writing these was telling me that I I would be harmed if I didn't stop looking around in these places. To hear the rest of this episode, as well as all of the episodes in this season of Pretend Podcast, Who's Afraid of LaDonna Humphrey? Just search up Pretend in your favorite podcast app.